Well, good morning, Island Baptist Church. I trust you have had a uh, great week. And uh, here we are uh, once again for our Sunday school time. And thank you for joining us. I'm looking forward to sharing the word of God with you again this morning. Uh, We're continuing to pray for Hong Kong with the uh, the virus and the various things happening with uh, the different political situations and uh, lots of people here in the United States asking uh, how things are. Matter of fact, uh, many people, when I tell them that we are moving to Hong Kong, uh, they are wondering, why are you moving to Hong Kong? And uh, I, I tell them, and they're very excited for us. Uh, they're actually a little nervous for us, but uh, I again reassure them that uh, this is God's plan, and when you're in God's, where God wants you to be, uh, you're the safest, in the safest place that you could be. So let's jump right into it this morning. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will uh, look into our series once again in Psalm 119. Let's pray. Lord, we we come to you this morning uh, asking for you to help us to open our hearts, help us to be willing to be honest with ourselves, help us to allow your word to, to search us and to know us and to reveal any wicked way in us. Uh, Lord, we want to follow uh, your plan. Lord, you have revealed that to us uh, through Jesus Christ and through your word. And Lord, we have the word right in front of us this morning. And I pray you'd help us, those of us who say that we are believers in Jesus Christ, that we'd be willing to follow what your word says. Uh, Help me to communicate clearly this morning. May you help us to be willing to change, to become more like you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would go ahead and turn your Bibles to Psalm 119. <clears throat> if you were with us last week, uh, you uh, got to hear the first part as we are jumping into this. If you're not able to be with us uh, last week, which is fine, I know there are a variety of circumstances, I want to just give a little bit of a review on what we talked about last week. And I want to start that review by going ahead and reading, <clears throat> again, the first eight verses of of Psalm 119. And remember, as we read through these verses, David, in this longest psalm, is using several different words to describe the main theme of this psalm, and that is the Word of God. And we highlighted those words last week. Um, I think you'll see them as we read through here again. So Psalm 119, verse 1 through 8, I urge you to have your Bible with you or your phone, your digital copy, one, one, one way or another, to be able to look at the Word of God. I think it's great to be able to have it, to see it, so I think it helps our recall. If we see it with our eyes and uh, hear it with our ears, I almost said see it with our eyes and hear it with our ears, that, that'd be bad. Uh, but if we see it with our eyes and hear it with our ears, and then also if you want to take notes, uh, all of those ways help us with recalling the information that we uh, have heard and learned. Now, some of you that are students, you already knew this, or teachers, you're way ahead of me. But uh, let's open the Word of God, and we'll read together Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. You follow along as I read. Psalm 119, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do, do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. I'm going to go ahead and keep reading uh, down through verse 16. So let's follow along uh, down through verse 16. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. 
So here, even in the first 16 verses, we, we very early on in this psalm see this emphasis that is being made regarding the Word of God. That David is going to highlight this theme throughout this chapter. And last week, we really talked about the idea that David delighted for the Word of God. He longed for the Word of God. He was committed not to forget the Word of God. Uh, he wanted to pursue it with his whole heart. And at the first part of last week's lesson, we really challenged ourselves and asked ourselves, could that be said of us, that we delight after the law of the Lord? Now, here, here's what I'd like you to do right at the start of this message. I'd like you to think back on your time this last week. I want you to think back on how it was spent. Could it be said, as we look back on the way our time was spent, could it be said that we delighted, that we longed for, that we pursued the word of God with our whole heart. Now that's not to say that you take the time that you do and compare it with everything else. And if everything else is more time than the word of God, and that means you don't love the word of God, that's not the point. The point is not how much time. The point is, did we value it? Was it worth it enough to us to take time to be in this book each day? Was it worth it for us to carve out time intentionally to be in the Word of God, that we delighted in the Word of God. Remember last week, we said that if we have that pursuit, we want to know that it's worth it, right? And we use the illustration of, if I'm going to spend hard-earned money on something, I want to know that it's worth it to do that. And we looked last week at one of the many benefits of pursuing the Word of God with our whole heart, that one of those many benefits is that God's Word gives comfort. And we looked at several verses, but let me highlight one that we looked at last week. Verse 92 says, unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine afflictions. In other words, the psalmist recognized that if, if God's word had not been important to him, if God's word had not been his delight, he would have been in serious trouble in his affliction. And I even gave testimony of my own experience, testimony of my own experience when my, my first wife, Julie, passed away in 2013 and how the word of God strengthened me and comforted me. So we know that that delight in the word of God, that wholehearted pursuit of the word of God is not wasted because the word of God brings comfort. We will find that. This morning, we're going to look at a second benefit, a second reason why we ought to delight in the word of God, more than just God's commanded it. That's enough. God saying, you should delight in my word. That's enough reason. But those that's not the only reason. And David highlights several reasons as to why it is a benefit, why it will be a blessing for you if you will wholeheartedly pursue the word of God. I want to jump into the second blessing by talking about something first, and then we'll kind of get to uh, the second benefit. Many of you have heard the name Marie Kondo. Have you heard this name? Marie Kondo has birthed the idea of condoing or using Con Marie, Con Marie, or Con Marie. You'll probably tell me whichever way is the right way. It is a process of decluttering your home by touching each item and determining whether that item sparks joy. She has a, had a Netflix series called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. And her popularity, especially for a while, really skyrocketed here in the U.S. If you've never heard of her, don't worry. I hadn't heard of her either. All right. Some of you are like, oh, yes, I, I, I know who this is. And your, your interest is peaked right now. This sparking joy that she termed it was a simple and effective way to banish clutter forever. Uh I thought as she was going through this, if tidying up your house is truly what sparks joy, I'm afraid I was must have been a very depressed young man growing up. Uh, my mom would agree with that. My room was not very clean growing up, so I, I must not have had much joy. And obviously, I'm, I'm joking about that. But here's how she describes you do this. You take each article of clothing or each piece uh, in, in your house, and you grasp it in your hand, and you see if it sparks joy in you. If it feels like every part and every cell of your body is lifted up little by little while you're holding it, then you keep it. On the contrary, 
when you touch an item that does not spark joy. Every part of your body would feel like it is weighted down. You'll be more sensitive as you try this more often. She instructs you to try it with each and every piece of clothing you own to see if the item makes you happy or joyful. So here I go. I'm going to try it with my tie. It actually makes me feel weighed down, so I'm going to get rid of my tie. I'm just kidding, okay? But that's really the idea. If it makes you feel happy, it remains with you. If it weighs you down, you get rid of it. And this is the way to tidy your house. And in this book, she even suggests that if you have a book and there are certain pages in the book that wear you down, you tear out those pages. Wow. I know Shinto religion has played a part in her ideas. And I'm not necessarily saying that everything about Marie Kondo is bad. That's not the point at all. You'll see where I'm going with this illustration. But listen to what she said, how she came up with this idea. She said, one day I had a, a kind of nervous breakdown and fainted. I was unconscious for two hours. When I came to, I heard a mysterious voice, like some god of tidying, telling me to look at my things more closely. And I realized my mistake. I should be identifying the things that make me happy. That is the work of tidying. So this is Marie Kondo's own description of how she came up with this plan. Now, again, I'm not saying that if you take some of her ideas that there's, that's a problem. I'm really using this as an illustration to talk about this idea of joy. You know, I'm not sure uh, holding a piece of clothing is going to spark joy in your body. I don't know. Maybe some people feel that. That's a little interesting to me. But you know what? I do know that it's true that humans all over the world, whether it's here in America, whether it's in a wealthy country like Hong Kong or a wealthy country like America or in Singapore where I've been or really in any other country in the world, I know that people are continually searching and pursuing things that will make them happy. We want to be happy. And let's face it, there are many people in this world that are pursuing that joy and pursuing that happiness, and they are failing in this world. You know, you can go to the internet and find hundreds of websites developed to this subject or dedicated to this subject of happiness. Matter of fact, I found a, a website called happiness.com. And not to be outdone, there was another website listed right after it called authentichappiness.com. I guess the first website wasn't authentic. Now this one is authentic. And these websites do their best to suggest ways that people can find happiness. Uh, here, here's a few, few things that were listed on some of these websites. If you want to find happiness, get outside. Create a morning ritual. Take chances. These are, these are actually listed on their website. Turn off the TV. Now, that actually might be a good idea. Travel. Exercise. Kiss in the rain. There you go. If you're a young married couple or if you're an old married couple, I guess happiness comes from kissing in the rain. Who, who knew? Uh, I like this one. They said happiness comes if you talk to old people. Uh, here's another one. Happiness comes if you do nothing. Oh, maybe we ought to try that. See how that works. Uh, stop watching the news. Make an awesome dessert. Treat yourself like a favorite child. And then here is, the, here is one. If you want to find yourself happy, pretend you're happy. Again, these were actual things listed on these websites, happiness.com and authentichappiness.com, for how you can make yourself be joyful. Some readers tell us that being healthy makes you 20% happier, and that marriage makes you 10% happier. Listen to this. But each child you have reduces your happiness by, by 0.25%. I have five kids. I must be a really depressed person, according to these statistics. You know, statistics estimate that here in the United States, there are 20 million depressed people. It's no wonder that 35,000 Americans commit suicide every year. I did a quick search before preaching this message about Hong Kong. There was an article recently in the South China Morning Post about how depression is really plaguing people even more during this COVID time, and suicides are going up. And that even before COVID, Hong Kong reported statistics that one out of every 10 people in Hong Kong struggles from serious depression. This is a real issue. 
Depression is one of the major diseases of our modern time. And you would think that as advanced of a place like America is, or advanced of a place like Hong Kong is, and as much wealth and opportunity that is in both of those places, that, oh sure, maybe a really poor country, there would be struggle with depression. But in a place like Hong Kong, in a place like America, depression? How in the world could that be happening? Several weeks ago, I had a, a young lady come to talk to me and wanted some counsel. And she came to me and declared, she said it this way, I have depression. As if it was a disease that she contracted and there was nothing that she could do about it. It would be just like somebody saying, I have the coronavirus, except she said, I have depression. I'm thankful that as I talked to this young lady, she was able to see that that is not how God wants her to live. And there are choices that can be made. And there are answers from the word of God for us. You see, God's word, here's, here, we're getting to our second blessing. You probably wondered when we were getting there. Listen to this. God's word brings joy and praise to the life of one who dives into the truths of God's word. In other words, if you delight in the word of God, if you wholeheartedly pursue the word of God, if you desire it, if you long for it, if you pursue it with everything you have, one of the blessings is that it brings comfort. But another blessing is that the word of God brings joy. You know, true joy in the life of an individual Number one, is produced by and grounded in God himself. You see, my friend, if you are watching this and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there cannot be true joy until you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's no peace without him. There's no true joy without him. And that is why Pastor Johnson and I urge you to come speak with one of us, reach out to one of us, Read God's word and find that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through him, John 14, 6. He brings true joy. It is God himself that gives joy and gladness in the heart. Uh, turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4. We'll be, we'll be back to Psalm 119, I promise. Psalm chapter 4. And let's look at verse 7. Psalm 4, verse 7. The Bible says, Thou hast put gladness, you could insert the word joy there if you want, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. In other words, the psalmist says, I look at the wicked and I, you know, everything, when everything's going well for them, their corn and their grapes are increasing, looks like everything's going well for them, but God has put a joy in my heart that is more than that. Uh, turn your Bibles to Psalm 16. Psalm chapter 16. Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of what? Fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Go to Psalm chapter 43. Psalm 43. Psalm 43 verse 4. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding what? Joy. My exceeding joy is in God. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O my God. Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And again, this is all showing where true joy comes from. We say, said, first of all, it is produced by God and grounded in God. Proverbs, excuse me, Romans 15, verse 13. Paul says, now the God of hope fill you with all what? With all joy. And notice, and peace. You talk about two things that people in this world are looking for. They want to be happy and they want to have peace. It only comes through God. Now the God of hope, hope's another thing people are looking for. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Um, go to Galatians chapter 5. 
Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, Galatians 5, 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not in the law. Now verse 19 and 20 and 21 give us works of the flesh. So he's comparing the flesh and the spirit. And he says there's this battle going on. But if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. But jump down to verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit. So he gives the works of the flesh, verses uh, 19 through 21. But in verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love. What's the next one? Joy. In other words, in the life of a true believer who is walking in the Spirit, you know what's going to be shown on their tree, the fruit that is going to be on their tree? They're going to have joy. They are going to be joyful people. So number one, this joy is produced by God, the Spirit of God working in us, and it is grounded in God. God is our joy. He is the one that puts gladness in our hearts. So let me ask you a question. Does God leave you? If you're a believer, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, does God leave you? No, he does not. Hebrews tells us he will never leave us or forsake us. He is always with us. So now here's the second question. Then how long should we go without joy? You know, it shouldn't be too long. Oh, I know there are things that happen. There are difficulties. There are struggles. But God has never left you. God has never drifted from you, and so you can have true joy, which leads us right into our second point. Number one, that joy is produced by God and grounded in God. And number two, joy is not based on our circumstances. In other words, things are going good, I have joy. Things are going bad, I'm depressed. That, that's not how it works for the believer, because God is always with you. Let's look at a couple passages here. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Don't worry, we're coming back to Psalm 119, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I guess this is all really by way of introduction. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2. Let's see. Uh, sorry, I am in 1 Corinthians. Let's see if I can get to 2 Corinthians. That will help me there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. He says here, how that in great trial of affliction, okay, so in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Did you see this? In great trial and affliction, there was an abundance of joy amongst these people. That, that's an amazing statement. Um, Many of you know Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord, how often? Always. And again, I say rejoice. Because you see, joy, as we saw in our first point, is not rooted in our circumstances. It is grounded in who our God is. And that doesn't change. So we can be joyful in spite of our circumstances. Go to one more passage, James chapter 1. Many of you could probably quote this verse. James chapter 1. In verse 2, James says, My brethren, or brothers and sisters in Christ, count it all joy when you fall into divers, or you could say various kinds, diverse temptations. How? How can you do that? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So even in the midst of a variety of trials, count it as joy, because God is building endurance in your life. So this joy is produced and founded in God, or grounded in God. Second of all, this joy is not based on our circumstances. In other words, we don't check out to see how the wind is blowing, and what's the weather going to be like today, and what are my finances, and what are my physical difficulties, and how are things going, and now I determine whether there's joy. No, no, no. This joy is rooted in an unchanging God who is working things out in our lives for his glory. So this joy is then... Third of all, let me just mention this. This joy is then reflected in you. 
It's reflected in me. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13. You don't have to turn there, but just listen to this. It said a merry, it says, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. Do you know, brother and sister in Christ, the joy of the Lord ought to show on our face? If I walk around all day like this, or even people wonder, wow, what, what's wrong with him? What, what, what's going on? And I'm not asking for believers to walk around with a fake pasted smile on their face. That's weird. Okay, that, that's, just, that's just odd. But there ought to be a sense that, you know what? I have Jesus Christ as my Savior. I have the God of the universe who is a sovereign ruler over all of these circumstances. I can rejoice and have gladness in my heart, and my face can show that. People ought to be able to sense that with you as a believer. Can I ask you a question? At your work, can people tell, you know what, they're just, they're just a cheerful person. Why are you so cheerful? And you have a chance to share with them the joy of the Lord. Now back to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, with all that in mind, how do we keep this joy consistently in our lives? And brothers and sisters, the benefit of having a wholehearted pursuit of God's word, it is that it is a right focus on this book that continues to give you joy in the midst of circumstances. Because this book reminds us of who God is. This book reminds us of what God has done. And this book points to us the fact that God is a sovereign ruler who is in control of even the most difficult circumstances in our life. Psalm 119, verse 54. Psalm 119, verse 54. Look at this. Thy statutes, okay, speaking of God's word, thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. In all my journeying that is having to go on, in all my varieties and twists and turns of my life, it is the word of God that allows me to sing and rejoice in the midst of all those things. Even in the midst of a culture where we feel out of place, God's truth, God's word, gives shelter to us. It's a refuge, and it provides genuine joy. It puts a song in our heart. No, we don't fit in in this culture, and we never will. We don't fill our hearts with the pleasures of this world. We are pilgrims. We are strangers. We are sojourners. Our citizenship is not on this earth. And this world that everyone else is looking for for fulfillment with money and pleasure and satisfaction with anything else, we know that does not bring true fulfillment, only in Jesus Christ. You see, we're not at home here. We're just passing through. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. I mentioned last week his treasury of David is a great tool to have in looking at the Psalms. He put it this way, What a folly is this, that a man should desire to dwell in the earth when God calleth him to be a citizen of heaven. You know, brothers and sisters, let's ask God to help us to get our focus on things above, not on things on the earth, Colossians chapter 3. You see, in the midst of feeling out of place and not at home in this world, in the house of our sojourning he just talked about, God's word puts a song in our heart. The sweetness of his word gives joy in the midst of hardships on this pilgrimage. I mean, just think of Paul and Silas, who literally not had a song in their heart. They were singing out loud and praising the Lord. One more verse here. Actually, two more verses. Two more verses. Number 62. Verse 62. David says this. At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee. Why? Because of thy righteous judgments. Now, I'm not sure if the psalmist is referring to rising at midnight on purpose, specifically to thank God, or if he's rising at midnight because he can't sleep because of things that are on his mind. I, I don't know. But either way, most normal people are not rising at midnight to praise God. But this is a representation of genuine joy over God. Many people lose sleep and are up at night because of worry and grief and heartache and fear, depression, guilt. 
But here the psalmist at midnight, in the middle of the night, is able to rejoice in his God when no one else is looking. Nobody else knows that he's praising God. But he does it because of God's righteous rules in his life. He praises him for his word. Look at verse 111. Verse 111. He says, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. So he's speaking of his testimonies here. And he says, They are the rejoicing of my heart. They bring joy in our heart. You see, God's word is his heritage. It's his lot, his portion, his inheritance that he can hold on to forever that doesn't change. Why does he desire to hold on to this? Why does he, decla why does he declare God's word as his inheritance and, and, and not wealth? Because of joy. Because of the joy that trusting in God brings. The joy that God's word gives to us. Let me ask you, what is it that cheers your heart? What is it that lifts your soul? What is it that allows your day to have a right perspective? Do you struggle with always looking to the next fun or good thing to bring you happiness? Does it take someone or something to bring you happiness? Or can you find consistent, true joy on a daily basis in God's word alone? And so you consider God's word extremely important to hold on to. You see, God's word teaches us who he is. God's word gives us perspective on our life circumstances, and it gets our eyes on things above. Brother and sister, I understand why many people in America would be struggling with joy during this pandemic. I mean, businesses are shut down. Uh, it's a very, very scary time. You see people wearing face masks everywhere, face shields even. Our normal daily life has been messed up here in America. Hong Kong, it's the same way. I understand why many, many people would be depressed and discouraged in Hong Kong. But my friend, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, even in the midst of very, very difficult and uncertain times, we can have true joy. You know, you're there in Hong Kong, and the, the future of, the, of, of Hong Kong is uncertain with some of the politics. Maybe you're from a different country and Hong Kong is kind of a second home to you and, and things back home are uncertain and you're just not sure you can have true joy because you know God never changes. And this is where we learn about him. Can I plead with you to spend time in this book? Can I plead with you to allow this book to be the filter through which you see the, the circumstances of life and may we find true joy in him alone? You know, Pastor is going through the book of Daniel. He's going to continue that here in our next video. I loved hearing his message last week. And one of the things you learn and see very quickly about Daniel and his three friends is that they did not allow circumstances to rob them of their joy. Their joy was rooted in who they knew God was, which gave them the courage to to speak and say, you know what, I'm not going to defile myself to King's me. But gave them the courage to stand up in front of when everybody else was bound, which gave them the courage and, and the lion's den. It would go on and on. It was a deep-rooted joy that came from knowing God. My brothers and sisters, the way we know God is in this book. Again, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you don't have that assurance, that's the most important thing you could do. Please reach out to me, reach out to Pastor Johnson, reach out to our church. We would love to take this book and show you how you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And be confident that you one day will spend eternity with him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the joy that it brings. We thank you for the comfort that it gives. May we be diligent students of it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.